The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory, Glory to, you, to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried out and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please. As I was preparing for today's uh, sermon, among other things. And I remember a time when we used to wait for the last minute, and the note I have here is that we would wait until two days before that five-page paper was due when we were in, in graduate school. And partly because it was like, it's only five pages, we can whip that out in a couple days, you know, it's not like we're creating prose and poetry, we're assessing or analyzing a, a mathematical problems. But we had also come to the point where we realized that we could do it in five days, in two days, and not have to worry about it. Of course, there might have been some questions about how well we wrote a five-page paper in two days, but we got the job done, and that was really what was important. Sometimes there is this thing called the elegant solution, where everything is beautiful and wonderful, and then there's my favorite, the brute force solution. Big hammer, wooden stick, round hole, square peg, make it get there. Not elegant, not beautiful, but it gets the job done. And sometimes I think we wait for the perfect solution, whatever that might look like. And as we, at least me, wait to make that perfect answer, you may make imperfect execution. The longer that I wait to do something, even if I can do it well, my execution may not be perfect. Just to kick things down the road, because I know that sooner or later I will find that little piece of information isn't really helpful. Do something and move on. So how do we live our lives, at least in general terms? Well, what we do as individual workers is often misunderstood or romanticized. Those ideal positions and jobs are often not like we imagine. I can imagine that being a professional athlete simply isn't playing baseball for six or eight months out of the year. Just like being a parish priest is more than just two hours on Sunday. The life and the profession that we live is a lot more nuanced than we and others expect it to be. As a professional person, we really don't know the full depth of what we profess when we make our profession. Not simply one like being a clergy person or a military person, which I've done now my two professions. But there are other professions that we make in our lives which are less obvious. Like the longest profession that I made back in 1980, to follow Christ as my Lord and Savior. 
that was a profession or is a profession that I have taken on. What I thought I was committing myself to and what I've experienced over the years are vastly different. The professions that we take on are, in fact, a process. As we experience the life that we live as professionals, we better understand the life of the professional. And regardless of how well we are called, profession is still work. With few exceptions, people just don't arrive at the final solution. But the work is the gift of our profession, and it is a gift that is given by God. And sometimes we need to remember that the trouble and the toil, while not given specifically by God, is in fact how we learn about who we are in God's kingdom. The disconnect between our profession and what we believe can lead us to difficulties in practice and can also lead us to disappointments. But in the difficulties and the disappointments that we feel, we will, in fact, find growth. As Christians and church people, not as an institution like the building across there, but us as a community, those things that challenge us and make us real about reevaluate who we are and what we do are a blessing. So my question is, what is the real work of a church? And what is the measure of the success of a church? Well, from the world's perspective, those are different than what they really are like. Being successful as a church, as a believer and a follower of Christ, is not about size. It's not about being without being accepting without standard or just simply blind acceptance of tenets of or faith of the church. It's about the real work of the church that includes difficulty which we might have problems describing or measuring. And what is it that we are called to do as Christians? To build disciples, to preach the good news of Christ in our lives, to be prophetic, and whatever that might mean, to be sacrificial, to give of ourselves in ways which only God can support, and of course, being set apart by service. That's what it means to be a Christian. Our Hebrew scripture today from Habakkuk is relevant even today, as probably more relevant today than it was even in his time more than many might expect. Habakkuk is called by God to be prophetic to Israel, to serve as one who seeks God and a better understanding of God at work in his life. But it's not just nasal ga navel gazing and inward looking. It's about mediating between God and Israel not simply on God's behalf, telling Israel what they've done wrong, but giving voice to the pain that Israel is feeling, to give voice to Israel's concern and Israel's perception of God. We hear that initially in the comment, Lord, how long will, you, will we cry for help? Habakkuk is specifically giving voice to Israel's feeling of abandonment and the apparent rise of a people who aren't living a godly life. Those people that they believe, that he believes, or his society believes, are succeeding at the expense of others. In Habakkuk's time, society was becoming more polarized, polarized and preferential to the rich and the unscrupulous. The Israelites have been oppressed, not by their fault, but they believe that they have been oppressed, not by their fault, but by God's abandonment. Israel feels that things should happen in their time, in what they think is God's timeline, or at least their perception, and not what God is trying to instill in them. 
the message that Habakkuk related to his people and relates to us today is layered. It is, in fact, a voicing of the concerns of Israel, the real concern that they feel, the abandonment, the disillusion, the disenchantment, the disenfranchisement of this company, this country. And yet he offers them the reality that God's time is not our time, that the end that is coming isn't here until it's the end. The end isn't until it is. We can think that the end is tomorrow or the next day or the next day, but until the end actually gets there and here, it ain't the end. Change can happen to the Israelites and for us as if we let it. But we need to remember, just like the Israelites were reminded in that day, that they need to go back to the standard and the requirements that were instituted in the covenant that they made with God on Sinai. They need to understand and consider where they have moved in that covenant, both positive and negative. The challenge for us is as we think about the life that we live and the direction that we are heading, we need to remember and to reflect on what God demands from us and what God gives us in return. And we need to remember and to be patient enough to navigate with God's guidance. God will, in fact, lead us in the direction that we need to go if we let God do that for us. So what is our reality in the scope of our scripture today? Well, we are continuing to seek God's plan for us literally day after day after day. I'm sure that there are some in here who might have a fear of the future to a certain extent and ask themselves, when will it end? And the answer is, when it's time. And not a second before. We are trying to consider how we can build disciples and grow our community in ways which are meaningful for us and for those people who are outside our four walls. We also are needing and have been spending time trying to figure out how we share the relevance that we have as a church and as a community of believers with our community. So what is it that brings us or we take with us from this place? How are we in fact called to be prophets of God in the world? Well, honestly, there are no easy answers. We know in our heart of hearts what we are called to do. First place I think we need to start is to reflect on our individual and communal relationship with God. And to remember that there is time to change. But that time is not our time. It is God's time. The time that we are called to change will be led and filled by God so that we can continue to move in ways which God is calling us. So what do we do? We assess where we are. We consider how God has touched us today, yesterday, and how God will continue to touch us in the days that lie ahead. We need to consider what it might be that keeps us from being our best self in God's kingdom. What is it that we do that gets, makes us get in the way of God at work in our lives? And yet it's not just the fact of how we get in our own way, but also we need to trust that God's direction will be present even when it feels forward to what we are and who we are and what we've always been. Because what we've been is what we've been. What we will be is yet to be determined. And lastly, we need to get out of the way and let God succeed. Because God will succeed in God's way if we simply get out of the way. As a community, our strength is in realizing the things that we do may not go our way. And yet we need to stay committed to God's plan. And remember that that commitment to God's plan 
while costly, is the way to truly live now and forever. God is calling us to be present for God in our community today and forever. Amen.